This program was made possible by contributions to your PBS station from viewers like you. Thank you. Um, coaching all Americans is very different. I mean, you have to you have to really know what you're saying because they know between uh, fiction and fact. Well, Miranel, this is such a treat for me. I can't even begin to tell you because I just adore you. Uh, and I think most of the people in this community, in the whole Upper Cumberland region, remember you as the head coach of Tennessee Tech here uh, a few years ago, but you have had quite an accomplished career. Marinelle Metters, you are a former TTU head coach of women's basketball, Florida State University head coach uh, of women's basketball, one of eight original head, head coaches of the WNBA, uh, also coach of the year when you were with the Atlanta Dream. Uh, in the Olympics in London, you were assistant coach for the U.S. team and won a gold medal. Look at your jacket, it's just, <laughs> I just love that. What a career. I've had a blast, I can just tell you, and it all started here. It all started in this city. I can remember um, when we first started our games and we played over in Memorial Gym, uh, we could count the number of people that were sitting in the stands and most of the time it was the parents of the players that were playing on the team. So it's been an incredible run for me, but uh, I, I can't ever forget this city and I can't ever forget Tennessee Tech for giving me the opportunity to play and to coach at this level. Now you have you were here what 16 years? I was here almost 20 years. Almost 20 years. Mm -hmm. Okay. And when you started here at Tennessee Tech, um, what was Title IX? Had that already come into existence yet? There was nothing here. I mean, they had no sports whatsoever for women to play. Wow. And I was hired as a professor in health, physical education, and recreation. Dr. Flavia Smith hired me. And in the back of my mind, I'm always thinking, you know, we need to start some women's sports. But I wanted to make sure that I got hired first right. and then <laughs> approach them on starting some teams. And um, it took a while to, uh, I guess, convince them that it was the right thing to do. And it's, it's on the move. It's, it's going to happen. Uh, let's be one of the first ones to start this. And so we started volleyball first, and then we went to basketball, and then we went to tennis and you can see what it is today. Wow, did you coach all those? I did, and taught <laughs> nine classes, and I'm going like, I have no free time. Oh my so goodness. So it was, it was quite a challenge, but it was well worth it. I loved every minute of it. Now you're back in town um, for the Hometown Champions uh, event. You're gonna be the guest speaker. Um, wh what does it feel like to be back here in Hooper Ebling Center? Well, I, I walked down the floor and I thought, you know, we sat here. Right. You know, and it, they've, they flipped the seats. Yes. So we had the opponents sitting where the home team now sits. And behind the home team, I don't know what it was about the, the rifle team, but they loved to sit behind the visiting team bench. And they gave them all kinds of flack during the game. It was just incredible. But, you know, we started... Uh, putting people in the stands mm -hmm. and it, you know the crowds got larger and larger and larger and uh, and a lot of it was because we were winning we got we got most of the players out of the state of Tennessee and it was all everything that we did over the years and uh, Bill World will tell you the same thing uh, it was all based on tradition mm -hmm. and support and commitment from the university to make things happen at Tennessee Tech when you say tradition what what do you mean by that what's a program built on tradition uh, it's been built on trust. I think uh, players trusted us to, to teach them and guide them in the, dir the dir direction that they needed to go. And a lot of them are coaching nowadays because, you know, they, we had a foundation. But our, my goal was always to lead, direct, and motivate not only the players but also the staff to, to move on to bigger and better things, and uh, most of them have. Do you think about what it takes to have a successful team? Do you, it, is that have you seen that carry over in so many phases of life? Well, you can never have too many scores, okay? <laughs> if you score, you're gonna win. And one of my favorite things to do is to win. I love to win. And I love to work hard and do whatever it takes to, to put together a, a really great team. But I think uh, a lot of times in, um, in sports 
and a lot of other things with uh, uh, businesses and everything. Mm -hmm. it, you know, people forget about the chemistry that you have on your team. Everybody needs to get along. Everybody needs to support everybody. And to me, when I went into the pros and everything, chemistry was huge. I mean, players were really good. They were all, every single one of them were all Americans and you're trying to coach them. And my goal when I was in the pros was to n not coach them, you know, <laughs> just just lead, direct, play. and motivate and let them play. And and nine times out of 10, they, they knew exactly what they needed to do. But um, working hard was one of the things that I always liked to do. I think I told you that um, when we were talking earlier that I, I talked with a Fortune 500 CEO and she said, when she hired, she looked for athletes mm -hmm. because they carried the, the kind of qualities that you wanted in a really top-notch employee. I think so. I think, uh, and, and especially in team uh, mm -hmm. sports, uh, you know, you have to get along with your teammates. You have to work together, and that's what businesses are looking for. Um, they're self-starters. They don't want people that they have to motivate to get going, and, and they want people that are self-starters, and it will do the job. How did you get started in basketball? Now, you're, you're not from Cookville. You're from Nashville, right? That's correct. Well, I grew up with three cousins and a brother, all male. <laughs> so there were no dolls being played in my household or mm -hmm. in theirs. Right. So we played sports all of our life. I mean, we did everything. And um, I just remember having a dream of playing someday. Um, didn't, there was nothing out there. Right. There was no, no teams or anything like that. So hmm. um, I knew that I would have to be one of the ones that would pave the way for others. So that's what I did. Wow. You went to MTSU? Mm -hmm. So when you, you went to Hillsborough High, so there, were, there was not a basketball team at Hillsborough High? Or was there? There, there was. The okay. city schools in Nashville did not have teams. The county schools did. Oh. My family lived in the city. And I started out in high school at West End High School. Mm -hmm. No sports. Wow. So I went over there and I went to class and I went to PE class and I'm going like, I can't do this. <laughs> so I went home and I went home enough sad to, and my parents saw that and I said, we got to move. <laughs> we have to move to the county. And you know, they did. Wow. Because they knew how important it was to me and also for my brother, but my brother went through and played, uh, he played every sport. Right. So he had opportunities, but the girls didn't. Wow. Times have changed, yes. haven't they? They really have, <laughs> they really have. How fantastic though. And your parents have to be so proud of you to mm -hmm. see that, to see that that move really jump-started a whole career for you. It did, and they knew it, and they knew, knew it would, but they didn't miss a game here. Really? They didn't miss a game I played in. They followed me everywhere wow. I went. And, you know, they just love the, love the sport. Um, everywhere I went, they went. So when you went to MTSU, you're a graduate of MTSU, did, did you, were you able to play any sports there? Were they in a mural sports, no collegiate sports? They had what they had, extra, uh, extra mural. Okay. And they had play days, which you would travel, say, to East Tennessee State, and there would be other universities there, play days. Mm -hmm. So you would play three, four, or five games per day. I mean, that is unheard of yes. now, but we didn't care. Right. We, just, did, we just wanted to play. If you, if you were growing up in today's time, Marinelle, is there a sport you would play today that maybe you didn't get to? Would it be basketball? I think it would be basketball. It's a, it's a great sport. Um, I was probably more defensive minded than I was offensive minded, but um, I, I just love the sport. What position did you play in basketball? I was a guard, point guard. Point guard. Mm -hmm. So you're the playmaker. Yes. So do you carry, do you think point guards make better coaches? I think they make good decisions because <laughs> they have to, because if not, the coach is going to tell you about it. Right. So I think uh, my goal as a point guard was to make sure that I set my other teammates up so they could mm -hmm. be successful. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think that just looking back, uh, I was very fortunate to have Sue Gunner coached me for two years at, at MTSU. And as everybody knows that she went on to LSU, she's passed away now, but she was an uh, Olympic coach in 1980 and mm. just uh, a terrific coach. And so I gained a lot of experience on what to do when she was coaching me. But then when, when she left to go take another job at Stephen F. Austin, I had one more year at MTSU 
So my teammate said, you're going to be the player coach. And I'm going like, <laughs> OK, I will try. Wow. So I was a player coach for a year. And then um, I got my master's degree and, and came here. What an incredible opportunity that was. It was. I didn't know what in the world I was doing. <laughs> I was just a player. Well, good for I you. I was though. not a coach. I well, was a player. <laughs> so, so she was really a mentor to you. She was. I mean, she was great. Uh, she, she laid out groundwork. You have to do this. You have to do mm -hmm. this. You have to do this. And she would make you do it until you did it right. And that's a good coach. I'm, I'm sure you've had other people who say you are their mentor. I'm sure you've had hundreds of people. Yeah. So are there, are there folks that you really look at their paths and you think, I'm glad, I'm glad I had a part in their life at some point? Mm -hmm. There's a lot of players I could name. Uh, one in particular, Mindy Campbell, uh, that is at Cookville High School. Yes. She, she was a terrific player. She did everything she had to do to make everything great over here. And I think she had a tremendous career here. Mindy Odom. Odom. Yes, Mindy Campbell, Mindy Campbell Odom. Odom. And, yeah. and she, you know, something that I see in her that I see in you is that real caring spirit mm -hmm. for the student. She's hard. She's tough with them, but she cares, really right. cares. And they know it. Yes. That, that's a key. Yeah. You can be tough on them, but they have to know that you really care about yeah. them. So when you got to the pros, that had to be really different. It was very different. Um, there was no recruiting. I think I had been recruiting so much over the last 25, 30 years that I was in the college game that when I finally got to a point where they have a draft and you pick them and they don't pick you, it's a pretty good feeling, you, yes. you know? Yes. And you could, you could select the players that you thought would be the best for your team. But yeah. the, the pros were, it's very different. Um, their daily lives, it's like going to the office, work, and then you go home. And mm. you don't have to worry about them until the next day when we come back to the practice floor. So, and you were the, you were the head coach GM, and that translates into you have control, more control over the actual team? Control over selection of players and coaching them. Okay. Yes. All right. So I, I was reading about you, you started coaching there the first year with the Charlotte Sting, is mm -hmm. that right? Charlotte Sting. Mm -hmm. And um, you had that first year was a little rough, but then you were like, had the great, you had, you were like great the next two years in playoffs, right? You made it to the playoffs? We did. We, um, the, the, the key on all of that was we'd win all our games at home, but we go on the road and couldn't win. Oh. And I'm going like, you know, you end up about 500 right. because you couldn't win. But we finally started winning games on the road too, so that, that helped. But then at some point, that, it was sort of bittersweet because it just, you were winning, but then they decided for you to move on. Right. So that's the pros, right? Yeah, that's the pros. They make those decisions. Uh, it's what have you done for me today? <laughs> and if it's not the right thing that day, then chances are they're gonna uh, move on to somebody else. How did, did that just really kind of send you for a spin? Because here you've been this incredibly successful coach and you were on a winning streak and yet, did that just kind of take the wind out of your sails a little? It did. Well, it did. And, you know, I was totally shocked because I've never been fired before in my life. And one of my friends said, well, you haven't coached. And I mean, you haven't, you haven't coached until you've been fired. When you've been fired, then you then you can go to coach again. So that's basically what you do. I mean, it's if it's not, if I'm not right for them, then I need to move on to where it's right for me and right. the next person. All right. Did you love the pros? I did. I enjoy the pros. Um, coaching all Americans is very different. Mm -hmm. I mean, you have to you have to really know what you're saying because they know between uh, fiction and fact, and they'll. I mean, you don't want to lose them, so you right. may have to make sure that you're you're two or three steps ahead of them, and is, you have good plays and things, and it fits their their team and hmm. what they do. Do you design the team? Do you design those plays? Some of them, yes. Okay. Yeah. I mean, if you've got a three-point shooter, you got to let them shoot the ball because right. that's what they do. Right. And you design plays that will get them open for that. Is there a lot of competition for these players in in the women's NBA? Oh yeah. Yeah, so, I mean, your, your draft the next year depends on what you did the year before, uh, the order in which you, you draft. And you can make trades and all those things, and that's what I did. Uh, my first year in Atlanta, 
I didn't know what to do. I had, I had all former players that were role models because I was an expansion team. Oh. So you got to select one player from each team, but it was one of the players that they did not protect, and they protected their top six or seven. Oh. So you got players eight, nine, 10, 11 on a team that really didn't play that much. Mm -hmm. So I selected the players, and I thought we had a pretty good little selection group, but uh, we went four and 30. I never lost that many games in my life, okay? <laughs> Probably in years, you know? Right, right. But I said, this is not gonna happen again. And I had a reporter ask me about, about the four and 30. I said, well, people better enjoy beating us now because it's not gonna continue. They never let me forget that. But I bet next not, because it didn't the next it year. It didn't. We just turned it right around and uh, went to the playoffs and won the conference championships and things like that. Didn't you have the second greatest turnaround ever second. in the history? Yep, Detroit the had the first. Okay. They, they beat us by one game. But wow. um, it was just really fun to see it move into that direction. How great for those players. Oh, too. they loved it. But a lot of those players that were four and 30 were not on the team the following year. Okay. <laughs> okay. okay, we kept the good ones, but we had to move the others sure. out. But I had to sure. make trades and things like that to make sure then and guarantee that I would get some top-notch players, and we did. So let's talk about the the Atlanta dream. That's where you, you were the coach, of, uh, again, a professional team, and you had just an incredible winning streak. You were, you got coach of the year, like in 2009, while you were with that yep. team. But then again, at some point, you're on this incredible winning team, and somebody, a new owner comes along and says, well, we think we've got to move on. Yep. I think they, uh, and this is really sad to say, I think they really wanted someone, uh, a male coach. Hmm. You know, I think that had a lot to do with it. Right. Um, they said they wanted to go in a different direction, and when you have ownership change, sometimes that, that happens. But, you know, that probably, the Atlanta Dream was probably my baby. I loved that team, and I loved that, that city. Mm -hmm. And we had great fan participation and all that. but. You know, you just have to not get let it get you down. You just got to yeah. keep going. You know, I think that's important for folks to hear is yeah. that here you're in this incredible career, you, you incredible winning coach, and yet you have had these moments where you ran into a stopping point, mm -hmm. and it wasn't your doing, but you had to you had to not give up though. Yeah. So is that something that you encourage your students and your kids and your your athletes is you can't give up? Well, that's one of the things when I have a, a new team each year, I have a, a new team, and I'll line them up around a circle, and I'll tell them to look to their left and look to their right. And I said, chances are, the person on one side of you is not going to be on the team. So you, you have to make sure um, you've got your veteran players that want to try to be friends with you and all of that. And I said, they're not your friends. You're, you're vying for a job. Yeah. So you give it your best. And I said, if it doesn't work here, it could work somewhere else. And it, it usually does. That's so I tell them, never, never, ever give up. Yeah. What, how do you define success? Well, I, th I think a lot of it goes to um, the players that you coach. And you watch them mature from the day you get them until the day they graduate or the day that they move on and they become a coach. And you see that you try to uh, instill your values and things like that in your players. And the qualities, I think, are so important. Uh, you know, you got to be honest with your players. You can't, you can't fool them. Yeah. And you have to know that what you're saying to them is the truth. And they, in turn, have to know the same thing. Sure. And they know that you're on your side. And uh, I think the support that you give each and every player is, is so important, especially nowadays with all the social media and everything that's going on. Anything can leak out, I mean, any, and it might not be the truth, but right. one of the things that you have to really do is to be strong and uh, with your values, and a lot of that comes from their parents. It came from my parents. Uh, work hard, do the things that, that's right, and continue to try to be successful in whatever you want to do. Those are great life skills, no matter what you do. No matter what you do, whether it's, you know, working in a hospital mm -hmm. or a nurse or, 
or teach in school, whatever, mm -hmm. give it your best. That's right. So you mentioned that you that Atlanta was a favorite team. Is, do you have favorite teams? Is there a particular year when you look back in your coaching career at each institution or place you've been, do you say, ah, oh, that was my favorite team? Well, this university, Cookville, Tennessee Tech, I loved each and every one of these players that were here when, when I was here. They were special. And they chose a, a city. Some of them came from large cities mm -hmm. and to a smaller town. And they had some adjustments to do. But they knew that when they walked on that court, they were free. They could do what they wanted to do. And um, they could practice hard and play hard. And I think all of that uh, evolved into winning and being successful. So why did you leave Tennessee Tech? Why? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Listen, I, I, I I knew that I knew that I had to do something. I wanted to, I wanted more. Mm -hmm. And not that, that I didn't have it here, because I did. I had a great situation here. And I will never ever forget the people in uh, the university for giving me that opportunity. But um, I'll just have to tell you this quick little story. I went to, to, te uh, to Florida State, mm -hmm. and I'm flying in down there. and. I'm looking out there and I'm going like, oh, where's the city? You know, it's all trees. All you can see is trees mm -hmm. when you fly in there. So I finally landed and everything and I went over and I did my media thing and all that with everything. And then I went back to the hotel and I'm going like, what have I done? You know, I second guessed myself. Did you so really? I did because I was so comfortable here mm -hmm. and I was so happy here. And it was the hardest decision I think I ever made was to leave here. That says a lot, Marinelle. Well, everybody here meant a lot to me. Yeah. And they had values like I had values. Yeah. And yeah. That's, hard to, that's hard to find everywhere. Yeah. So uh, Pat Head Summit was at UT the same time that you were coaching here. In fact, I remember a game that your teams played each other. Mm -hmm. um, was she a rival? Was she someone that you you competed against or you or were you buddies well there was nothing better than to beat Tennessee okay yeah. nothing better and we used to beat them quite often but as time went by we became buddies and That's cool. she's a special special person and you know she would give me encouragement and I'd talk to her and and all of the things that you do when when you have coaching friends and it's just sad that's what's happened to her and uh, I just, I would feel really bad for her because she was so young. But, um, you know, we were definitely rivals. Yeah. And the fans were definitely rivals. Oh, yeah. And so were the players. But um, it, it was fun. It was fun competing against rivalries like that. Well, especially that kind of talent. You guys really put, turned it on, yeah. both of you. <laughs> we played our best when we played Tennessee. That's right. So you had this incredible experience of coaching an Olympic team and going to London in 2012, 2012 is that right? Uh -huh. And winning a gold medal. Now yes. I want you to tell me about that. That had to be, that has to be a highlight of your career. It is, it is the highlight. There's no question about it. I was fortunate enough to be chosen by Gino Ariema to, to be one of his assistant coaches. And um, all of this was, lead, it was a lead up from uh, the 2010 World Championships. I was on his staff then. And usually the staff stays the same for the, the next Olympics. And to, to listen to him, um, a lot of people don't like him, you know, but he's a winner. And a lot of people don't like winners. But I'm telling you, he's, he's incredible. He's a master at what he does. And I learned so much from him. I'm still friends with him today. We'll text off and on all, all the time now. And um, what he's done at UConn has been yes. uh, incredible. Yes. And so how did that feel? You you got the gold medal, right? You're standing there. Yeah. And I, they're playing the national anthem. How did that feel? It, it was unbelievable. We're all standing there with, you know, a hand on our heart. And um, it's hard to put it into words, the feeling that you have, but you're like frozen in time. Mm -hmm. And that national anthem playing for everybody to hear and our players are standing on the first spot of the podium. Mm -hmm. uh, it's just, it's just um, gives you chill bumps. And you're thinking, wow, 
I never thought I would be here. And you don't know whether I was here and went to Florida State and went to the pros, whether the lead up was all of that combined that gave me the opportunity to be an Olympian. Right. Um, but I'll never ever forget that. Well, we're, we're gonna be out of time and I have about a million other things that I wanna ask you, but I just, I thank you for coming home. It means this is This is home. Um, you know, I started coaching here when I was 22 years old. Most of my players were 19, 20, and 21, but they listened. And um, they say the stare, you yeah. know, the eyes, <laughs> that that got their attention. Right. But they, they were just, they just wanted to win. And that first year is when we started getting uh, all the scholarships and things. And it was just incredible, the support that we had here. But this is home to me. I, I can tell you, I love this university. Well, we're so glad and congratulations on an incredible career. We know you're not done. You, there's going to be more things. I can't wait. If you ever want to come and help us out with a basketball game, we'd love to have you. I'll be more than happy to. All right. All Thank right. you. Thank, Thank you, Becky. This program was made possible by contributions to your PBS station from viewers like you. Thank you.